Good morning and happy Easter. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Um, <clears throat> we are going to uh, move slowly for this first minute or two so that those who are still uh, joining in are able to, uh, to get in before we really get rolling. It takes a couple minutes for everyone to go. Um, I do hope that you've had opportunity this morning uh, to check out the uh, worship bulletin portion uh, of the group page and um, maybe play through the uh, the song playlist uh, to kind of uh, spark that Easter moment. I hope you've seen uh, the church family greetings video that we posted. If you haven't, uh, when we're done here this morning, you're definitely going to want to go back and see that. And again, thank you to everyone who participated by sending video clips. Uh, thank you, Pastor Chelsea, for uh, kind of arranging all of this. And thank you, Landon, for the technical work behind it, uh, putting it all together for us. We appreciate it. And uh, we received some greetings this morning. Um, um, <clears throat> Josh Hampshire, Josh Hampshire, sends greetings, and uh, so we're we're glad that, uh, that he was able to see it. It was fun to see the Duvalls and several others. So uh, we're glad that you're um, able to be with us this morning. Um, also, before we begin. Uh, Robin wanted to give some greetings this morning as well. So I'm going to let Robin go ahead and take a turn to get us started this morning. Happy Easter. Um, in my devotions this morning, I was reminded how much God loves us and how he wants us to love him. And even though our love is so small compared to his, he pours his infinite love into us so that we can overflow with his love to other people. And I just wanted to say this morning, if Jesus isn't your Savior, ask him to be your Savior, and then you can really celebrate Easter with us today. Love you all. Happy Easter. All right. Uh, thank you, Robin, for uh, sharing that with us. Um, <clears throat> and, of course, uh, Pastor Chelsea's here with us, and uh, Landon's across the room. Our family's already had a, a good morning to get started with. And, uh, again, we want to welcome you. There are still people joining us, uh, and so we're happy that you're here. Um, <clears throat> we are going to uh, begin our worship this morning by sharing scripture together. And so I'm going to read for us from the Gospel of John, his version of those early morning um, events, uh, beginning with John chapter 20. And I'm going to start with verse 1, and I'm going to read like 18 verses. So John chapter 20, uh, verses uh, 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple and the one Jesus loved and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked, into the, and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw that uh, the strips of linen was lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen, while the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. Uh, he saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we do want to uh, have prayer uh, before we have our message this morning. So please join me as we pray uh, on this wonderful Easter morning. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this great day, this great celebration. Uh, it's been a great week. We've thought about your love for us and all that you've done for us as we uh, took part in our, our Last Supper, uh, commemorating, Lord, your Last Supper, and the meditations that we had on uh, that night and on Good Friday, Lord. Some of us were able to meet together here on the internet and think about your sacrifice and the cross. And then yesterday, Lord, as we waited and waited for today to come. And then this morning, Lord, waking up, um, just feeling a sense of celebration uh, that the tomb couldn't hold you. Celebrating, Lord, your resurrection and the promise of eternal life to your people. So we praise you and, and thank you for that today and, and celebrate with you, Lord. We ask that you'd be with everyone around the world today as, uh, as they celebrate this in, in all different places and all different kinds of ways. Uh, for we church people, Father, this is a different kind of year for us. We are accustomed uh, to big Easter gatherings in our places of worship. And today, Lord, we're not gathering in places of worship. We're gathering from our home places of worship. Uh, we're, we're gathering, Lord, uh, by way of the Internet once again. And, uh, and we thank you, Lord, even for that technology. We thank you for the ability to be able to do this. Not so many years ago, uh, had this same pandemic been hitting, things would have been going very differently in terms of being able to stay connected and, and, uh, and communicating with one another. So we thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> Lord, there's been a lot of uh, regular prayer requests as well. Uh, people continue to get regular illnesses. People continue to fight their ongoing uh, medical issues, Lord. Uh, vision problems and Parkinson's and cancer and heart attacks and all of those things. Uh, we've had several people, Lord, reporting a, about loved ones uh, on our uh, prayer list. Lord, you know each and every need and each and every request. And we ask, Lord, that you would, uh, that you would reach out and touch and bring physical healing uh, to everyone involved. That uh, that you would be glorified through your answers to prayer. We ask, Lord, that you would be with uh, the entire globe as we continue, Lord, to, uh, to deal with this pandemic. Uh, especially, Lord, be with all of the, the health care workers uh, and all of those essential workers, Lord, that are facing constant risk from the disease and continuing to work anyway. Uh, be with those, Lord, who have actually contracted it and touched them, Lord. Be with uh, those today who've lost loved ones because of this. Uh, give them, Lord, the comfort that only you can give. And uh, keep us safe, Lord. Help us to continue to have the wisdom uh, to move through this time uh, in a way, Lord, that would be pleasing to you. Uh, and that through it all, Lord, uh, your will would be done. And uh, you would work these things to the good in some way or another. We ask that you'd be with us, Lord, the rest of the day and the rest of the week, Lord. Be with Pastor Chelsea as she brings us a message from your word. And we will give you the praise. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> all right. Um, happy Easter, everyone. I'm glad you all could um, be with us together today to celebrate this special day. I want to start off by reading you a little story. Um, since it's Easter, we'll have a short story time. This is called How the Virus Stole Easter by Christy Bother with a nod to Dr. Seuss. <clears throat> Twas late in 19 when the virus began, bringing chaos and fear to all people, each land. People were sick, hospitals full, doctors overwhelmed, no one in school. As winter gave way to the promise of spring, the virus raged on, touching peasant and king. People hid in their homes from the enemy unseen. They YouTubed and Zoomed, social distanced and cleaned. April approached and churches were closed. There won't be an Easter, the world supposed. There won't be church services and egg hunts are out. No reason for new dresses when we can't go about. <laughs> Holy Week started as bleak as the rest. The world was focused on masks and on tests. 
Easter can't happen this year, it proclaimed. Online and at home, it just won't be the same. Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, the days came and went. The virus pressed on, it just would not relent. The world woke Sunday and nothing had changed. The virus still menaced, the people estranged. Poo poo to the saints, the world was grumbling. They're finding out now that no Easter is coming. They're just waking up. We know what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two, and then all the saints will cry, boo hoo. That noise, said the world, will be something to hear. So it paused, and the world put a hand to its ear. And it did hear a sound coming through all the skies. It started down low, then it started to rise. <clears throat> but the sound wasn't depressed. Why, the sound was triumphant. It couldn't be so, but it grew with abundance. The world stared around, popping its eyes. Then it shook. What it saw was a shocking surprise. Every saint in every nation, the tall and the small, was celebrating Jesus in spite of it all. It hadn't stopped Easter from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the world with its life quite stuck in quarantine stood puzzling and puzzling. Just how can it be? It came without bonnets. It came without bunnies. It came without egg hunts, cantatas, or money. Then the world thought of something it hadn't before. Maybe Easter, it thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Easter, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, the story's not done. What will you do? Will you share with that one or two or more people needing hope on this night? Will you share the source of your life in this fight? <clears throat> the churches are empty, but so is the tomb. And Jesus is victor over death, doom, and gloom. So this year at Easter, let this be our prayer as the virus still rages around everywhere. May the world see hope when it looks at God's people. May the world see the church is not a building or a steeple. May the world find faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. May the world find joy in a time of dejection. May 2020 be known as the year of survival, but not only that, let it start a revival. <clears throat> I saw that online this week and I thought it was so appropriate um, given how different our Easter celebration is this year from every previous year that there is. Um, there's no pancake breakfast, no fancy new clothes or cantatas or dramas. Um, no group egg hunt. All those fun extras that we used to celebrate have been canceled or modified, but today is still special. Um, and that's because when all of that is cleared away, there's still something left. Something that can't be canceled, removed, or defeated, not even by death. And that's Jesus Christ, our resurrected King. We honored and remembered Jesus' sacrifice on the cross on Friday, and today we celebrate that that wasn't the end of the story. Jesus rose and claimed victory over death. He is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Okay. <laughs> Let's try one more time. He is risen. He, he is has risen, risen indeed. indeed. <laughs> okay. Um, and the Bible tells us that's just the first fruits. That if we believe in him, we too can have eternal life through him. So praise the Lord. But to fully appreciate the significance of the resurrection, I think that we need to look back at even more of Jesus' life. Um, we need to remember what came before to understand the significance of what is happening now. So during the days of Jesus' ministry, he proclaimed the kingdom of God, that it was here, that it's a new, different type of kingdom, and that Christ himself is our king, God in the flesh, here to usher it in. His miracles were signs that he was telling the truth, but his death on the cross appeared to be the end of that kingdom. 
His resurrection, however, was the ultimate validation of everything that he claimed. It demonstrates not only that his kingdom is at hand, but that his kingdom is eternal, never to end, unstoppable even by death. So today, I want us to look at the good news of this new, different, eternal kingdom where God reigns and his will is done. In God's kingdom, there is no isolation. So with our shelter at home order, we all are physically isolated right now, more so than we normally would be. But this is temporary, it will pass. However, it underscores a deeper truth. We are isolated in a new way right now, but we are not new to isolation. That is the way of the world. Sin separates us from God and from each other. It keeps us apart and alone. However, this kingdom is good news for the isolated because in God's kingdom, no one is isolated. God is with us. Um, from the time of Jesus' birth, God literally came here to the earth to be with us, Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. Um, throughout Jesus' ministry, he constantly was reaching out to people who were isolated from everyone else, who were living alone and on the fringes. Uh, there's a time when he bumps into a man who is possessed by demons, so many that um, they're called legion, and this man's life is so messed up that he's isolated from the rest of his community, but not inside of a comfy home. He can't stay in that kind of a place. He's literally living out among the tombs outside of town. And Jesus meets this man in that place and he sets him free from those demons and that oppression because no one remains isolated when Jesus comes along. When Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem, he stops along the way and meets a woman at a well. And she's a Samaritan. So the fact that she's a Samaritan and a woman would make it odd for a Jew like him to be chatting with her. But this woman, besides being at the well, is living a pretty isolated life. The fact that she's at the well at the time of day when Jesus is shows that she is an outcast from her community. She's not there when the rest of the women go, and that's because of some lifestyle choices that she's made. But Jesus reaches out to her anyways. He constantly is reaching out to those who are separated by physical issues. They're blind or they're paralyzed and they can't fully join in with everyone else. And these are the people that Jesus chooses to focus on and to continually draw closer and closer to him. Also, sometimes he's with us before we even recognize or realize it. So when he's talking to that woman at the well, um, he asks for a drink and she is having this conversation and he says to her, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for living water. So she's talking to him, but she doesn't realize that standing before her having this conversation is the son of God reaching out and offering living water, eternal life. Um, Mary in our story today in John chapter 20 is at the tomb just broken in grief and sorrow alone because Jesus is missing. We celebrate the empty tomb, but that wasn't a good sign for Mary initially. She thought someone had stolen Jesus. So the empty tomb just added to her grief. And into that, Jesus strolls and she doesn't recognize him at first. She thinks he's a gardener. Sometimes, Jesus is with us and we just take a little time to realize, to recognize that. But despite all of that, he is with us and he knows us. He's not just present, he knows you. In John chapter 10 verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Now. God the Father and Jesus Christ know each other well. <laughs> they are one and they will the same things. Um, 
And Jesus says that he knows you like that. He knows what's going on with you. When he met that woman at the well, he told her all about her life. He was able to say, hey, I know what your living situation is. I know what's going on with you. I know you. And when she ran off, that was her message to everyone. I met this guy and he was able to tell me everything I'd ever done. So Jesus isn't just present, but he knows you. Mary, when she meets this gardener, doesn't recognize Jesus until he calls her name, Mary. And then she realizes this is the Lord. Now, when I was working at Modine, um, for a while I got sent up to be the front lobby receptionist. And so I would greet all the visitors that came to our building. And some of these visitors were like a one-time thing doing a business deal, but there were also a number of people that would come back regularly or semi-regularly and um, fix things or bring things or whatever. There's all kinds of different business. And I shared that job with other people. I wasn't up there full time. And one of the other receptionists that did the bulk of the time had this sign that she taped to the inside of our desk where we would see it all day long as we were sitting there. And it had a quote from Dale Carnegie on it that said, a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. And the point of that was to remind her and me and anyone else filling in there um, how important it was to take the time to know the people coming in and to remember their name and to greet them personally. And I was always impressed because remembering names is kind of a struggle for me, but no matter who came in, if they had been there before, she could, it's like, oh, you were here three months ago and told me about your mother, I remember. And she could greet everyone by name. And Jesus knows us like that. He knows your name, he knows all about you, and he calls all of us by name. He's calling you by name. Um, and we know that that's true because Jesus himself told us multiple times and in multiple ways. He tells a story where there's a shepherd with a hundred sheep and one goes missing and he leaves the 99 to track that one down. There's a coin that someone loses and they take the time to track that down. Jesus wants to be with you and will continue to chase you down and call your name. He wants that close personal relationship. Besides God being with us, as comforting as that is, sometimes it's also nice to have a broader, deeper community. We as Christ followers should be bringing people into that community. So when we join God's kingdom, he helps to bring down those barriers inside of us that prevent us from living well in community with others. So selfishness, hate, greed, anger, all those things that cause conflict and strife and keep us apart, he helps to root those out from inside of us so that we can have close, loving relationships with others. We can partake of the encouragement and support of the community and we can offer encouragement and support to the community. Now, one of the biggest differences that marks this eternal kingdom of God is that it welcomes everyone. Literally everyone is valued and welcomed in this kingdom. Race, class, um, what you can contribute production-wise, your gender, your socioeconomic value, all of those things don't matter in terms of allowing you to belong. Now, following Jesus doesn't erase every difference, but it takes out um, the barrier that those differences create. All of those are special and unique and important and valued. Jesus demonstrated that throughout his entire ministry. From the start, when he chose his little group of disciples, that was an eclectic, mismatched bunch. They would not have just been best friends if Jesus hadn't come along. And then he, over the course of his ministry, one day would be eating with tax collectors and sinners, and the next would be teaching the religious leaders, having a chat with Nicodemus. Um, he welcomed little children. He included the women. We talked about the woman in the well and Mary Magdalene, who was so close to Jesus. Um, he welcomed Samaritans. He helped centurions, 
no one was outside of God's care or love at any point. Um, <clears throat> so all are welcome in this community. And when we join this kingdom and start to follow, then we also should be helping to spread that kind of community and forming a community. So the woman at the well had been living an isolated, outcast kind of life. When she heard Jesus talking and wanted to follow him, she ran back and talked to her community about what she had seen. And then they came and listened and she created this whole new community in her, in her village of people following Jesus. So they all were a part of that now. And she was in community with them again, restored to them. In Acts chapter 10, after this has happened, Peter has a weird vision with the blankets and all that stuff. So he's spent his whole ministry with Jesus seeing him interact with all these people, but it still takes a little time to sink in. But finally, he's invited to the house of a Roman centurion, and he goes inside his house with his whole family, and he steps up to give a speech to them. And he starts off and says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. And he preaches about all that he's seen Jesus do, and God pours the Holy Spirit down on these Romans, and it becomes clear that there isn't a restriction or a division there like there is in the rest of the world, that they are also included in this community, an important part of it. Now Mary, and our story today is shocked and horrified when she finds the empty tomb. As we said, she doesn't know yet that it's empty because he's risen. She hasn't gotten to that good news part yet. So she runs off right away to get Peter and John and to bring them along so that they can wonder with her and help her figure it out and share her grief. Um, when we follow Jesus, we start to get this other support built around us that's there as well. And then when she does finally see Jesus and realize who he is and has that conversation with him, she immediately runs off again to tell other people, to encourage the community and to spread that word so that everyone can know, I have seen the Lord. He is there. As we are drawn into this community, as we are included and we're given um, this connection with other people, we also should be actively extending this radical, open, diverse community to those isolated by the world. And that's more than just allowing different people to attend church with you. So hopefully our churches are places where if you go and look, there are groups of people gathered who would not normally just be the best of friends, who you wouldn't necessarily see all in the same clubs outside, um, they wouldn't all live in the same neighborhood, maybe. There's different races. There's different socioeconomic levels. There's different careers. The church should be a community made up of everyone. And it's great if that's true. But as a part of the church, we need to all be willing to take it a step further and not be satisfied to just say, yeah, there's people different from me that show up on Sunday for an hour that I sit kind of close to. But... Do you actually consider them your friends? If I had you write down a list of your friends, and then you looked at that list, how many of those friends on your list are people that are different, that the world has isolated maybe, that you don't naturally just share every common thing with? Um, as Christ followers, we should be building connections that go deeper than just that surface of saying, oh yeah, I see them once a week. That's I've done my duty, that's good enough. We have this true connection now where every person should be valued and as Jesus wants to know them, we also should be trying to get to know people in a real and deep way. Now, I'm talking about the fact that in God's kingdom, there's no isolation. So you probably are like, well, what does that mean in the days of pandemic? Because I feel pretty isolated. <laughs> Sadly, that's the way it goes. And the truth is that at the resurrection, everything changed and also nothing changed. Um, death was defeated 
the kingdom of God is active and it's spreading, but at the same time, it's not yet fully realized here. Um, it's already started, but not yet complete. So we pray for God's will to be done on earth. On earth, We do our part to bring it about. We try to follow his will, but it isn't fully being followed here yet. So while Mary and the disciples realized what was going on and were able to follow Jesus and be a part of this kingdom, that didn't immediately mean that the Jewish leaders and the Romans suddenly weren't after them anymore, that everything was suddenly wonderful. There were still a bunch of early Christians who were martyred. There still is pandemics that happen today. The world didn't immediately become perfect and wonderful. Death ultimately is defeated, but we still grieve and suffer now. We're not promised an easy, comfortable life, but that God will be with us through it all, and that the body of Christ will also be with us through it. We're not alone. We're not facing any of those hard things apart. Um, we may have to face darkness and defeat, but it's only temporary, and we win in the end. And in the meantime, we have people there helping us through. So a couple notes for you um, based on this in terms of how you um, live in this community in the middle of this quarantine. Um, whether you realize it or not, God is with you. So there's a, a famous poem called Footprints in the Sand. If you're not familiar with it, look it up. It's really fun. But someone's having a fake conversation with God and they're saying, um, you know, I followed you and things were great and then things got hard and you weren't with me. And they like look back at the footprints behind them and there's only one set. And then God answers, well, where there's only one set, that's where I carried you. So it's not that God was missing, God was helping out extra. I recently saw a comic, if you are familiar, um, where they added on and that groove over there is where I dragged you. <laughs> so um, the point is though, sometimes we don't necessarily feel like God is with us, but that doesn't change the fact that he is. The truth is God is with you whether you feel him or not, whether you recognize him or not, whether you see him or not, you are not separated from God. He is there with you right now. Nothing can separate you, him from you. Crucifixion and a stone-sealed tomb couldn't keep him down. And if that is true, then what do you think is going to keep him from your side right now? Just being stationary? That's not going to be enough to do it. So, one, God is with you. Two, in this new God kingdom kind of love that we've got going on, that means that as we're building this community and extending connection and love to everyone around us, um, part of what we do to do that is that we love the most vulnerable, the least, and we do so sacrificially. So ironically, we love our community by not physically seeing them right now. Um, it's kind of weird that to truly connect with people and to have that strong community, we don't get to physically be there in their presence, but that is one way that we honor this new kind of community where everyone has value and where everyone matters. We don't say every man's in it for himself, I'm probably fine, so I'm gonna go out and put others at risk. We say, well, I love those others, so I'll choose to limit my interactions and my activity. We love from a distance right now. But that doesn't mean that we don't love or care for each other even as we are apart physically. So if you're trying to love from a distance, a couple ways you can do that. If you can sew, make a mask. If you have money to donate for food, do that. Um, make phone calls and emails and video chats and posts and connect with people in those sorts of ways since you can't see them face to face. Reach out and let them know you're thinking of them especially people that you know are alone or people that you know that are one of those essential workers that's still having to go out all of the time. Let them know they're appreciated um, and that they're remembered and that they're cared for. You can put hearts in your window or you can decorate your sidewalk with sidewalk chalk. 
You can do all kinds of new and creative things to let people know that you care about them, even though you're not physically standing right in front of them. And last, if you are quarantined with other people, if you're not just sitting alone in your house, um, take this time to really think about how you can show extra love to them. So when you're with someone all the time, I'm sure that it gets easy to um, notice their flaws, to get a little irritated when they're doing those things that bother you. But um, this week, go out of your way to be forgiving and to recognize uh, when people need a little extra patience. And if people need a little time, you know, let them go to another room and don't get frustrated that they don't want to watch the same show or do the same thing. So think of something intentional that you can do this week to show love to those that you are living with. Um, maybe cook a meal for them if you're not the one that's normally the chef or bake some cookies uh, or brownies. If you're not the one that normally does the laundry, step up and do a load of that, including folding and all of that. Don't just make a bigger mess. Um, if you're not the normal cleaner, maybe take a turn with that. Vacuum a rug or clean a bathroom. Um, let them choose the movie. Find something that they normally do and maybe don't enjoy so much and step up and show your love to them in that way because um, community isn't just something that we do for those far away, but we don't want to overlook those who are closest to us and, um, you know, maybe struggling just with familiarity. We don't want to let that get stale. So think of something, go for it. And bonus points, if you report in on that in our group this week to let us know what you've done for someone that you're quarantined with. Um, so... In conclusion, with Jesus' resurrection and the establishment of his eternal kingdom, true isolation is abolished forever. And I hope that you'll join him on this mission. Um, as we're physically separated for a little while, we can remember that no one is truly separated from God or from each other anymore if they will call on his name. Because with his resurrection, his kingdom was established forever. And we all can be a part of that and share in that life and in that kingdom. May you experience rich community with him and with others, even if it's over a little more distance than normal. Happy Easter, everybody. <laughs> Happy Easter again. And uh, before we go, I just want to give you two quick reminders. Uh, Tuesday evening at 7, uh, I will be hosting a Zoom app Bible study uh, based on the first Easter evening that the disciples experienced. And then Thursday evening, we'll have our Zoom prayer gathering. Both of those are at seven o'clock and uh, the uh, invitation will be posted here on our group page and it's also in the scoop and it's also uh, will be sent on email and that sort of thing. So look forward to those. Um, that's it. And, uh, <laughs> that's it. Let's have a, a brief uh, closing prayer and then we're done for the day. Father, we do thank you for this day and for this message. We thank you, Lord, for your love. Help us, Lord, uh, to uh, be good citizens, live in community the way you would want us to, and show love uh, even under these circumstances, especially under these circumstances. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs>